Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third season of the Middle East Librarians Association's Social Justice Lecture Series. My name is Denise Sufi. I'm the Metadata Librarian for Middle Eastern Languages at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a member of the Social Justice Committee, and I'll be your host today. I'd like to thank the committee for helping me organize this event and the rest of the series. Thanks also to Harvard University for providing the Zoom access and to everyone who donated to our fundraising campaign so that we can offer honorariums to all of our speakers. Just a quick reminder that we're still looking to raise at least $500 for this season. So if you have anything to spare to support our series, the link is in the chat and I will put that in right now. This lecture series hosted by the Middle East Librarians Association Social Justice Committee aims to increase awareness of social justice principles in our professional practice, as well as to bring attention to how libraries and archives are supporting or failing to support crucial research on issues related to social justice. For this third season of the Social Justice Lecture Series, which we have entitled Lives in the Margins, Ethnic and Religious Minorities in the Middle East, we seek to combine and expand the themes of the previous seasons. We are inviting scholars researching minority groups to speak about the questions they are attempting to answer and the barriers they face to accessing resources. And we are also hosting informational information professionals to reflect on whose heritage is being preserved and how and why or why not. Now on to the main event. Today we are honored to welcome Dr. Josh Mugler, curator of Eastern Christian and Islamic manuscripts at the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library. He and his team of catalogers manage a collection of nearly 50,000 digitized and microfilm manuscripts from libraries around the world. He completed his PhD in theological and religious studies at Georgetown University in 2019, with a dissertation focusing on interactions between Christians and Muslims along the Byzantine border in 10th and 11th century Syria. He also holds a Master of Theological Studies degree from Harvard Divinity School, and has published on various aspects of the history of Christian-Muslim relations. Since completing his PhD, his work with HMML has included cataloging manuscripts from Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Turkey, Jerusalem, Ethiopia, Yemen, and elsewhere in a wide variety of languages and from multiple religious traditions. Originally from St. Louis, he lives in Minneapolis with his spouse and two 10-year-old cats. We're so glad to have you here with us. So without further ado, we hope everyone enjoys today's lecture, Digitization, Digital Cataloging, and the Minority Communities of the Middle East. Dr. Mugler, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Denise, and thanks everyone for being here. It's a real honor to be invited and to have all of you here today. Um, as I uh, start this presentation, I wanna make sure um, I'm noticing now that I have it up that uh, in the default Zoom view, uh, there's a bunch of pictures of uh, participants over on the right side of the screen, but I have to minimize that because um, there's actually a, a nice little drawing on this manuscript that I have a picture of that's being hidden by everyone's uh, little squares. Uh, so make sure that you can see the, this, this little drawing over here. Um, I chose this manuscript image because it's a, uh, uh, the, the title of the series is uh, about communities in the margins. Um, and I, I like that this, uh, this manuscript actually has a, a picture of someone here in the margin. Um, this, this manuscript is in Jerusalem and it's actually a uh, manuscript in Kurdish. Uh, so um, it's uh, appropriate for a discussion about uh, minority communities in the Middle East. It's a, the famous uh, romance of Mem and Zin, uh, one of the great uh, Kurdish um, romantic romance poems. Uh, and this manuscript from 1769, someone has, has gone through and drawn uh, a variety of, of pictures in the margins. Um, some I imagine may be more uh, relevant to the story than others. Um, some more uh, appropriate for display than others. Um, but uh, the, I, I wanna talk about um, uh, the, the work that um, uh, the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library or Himmel uh, has been doing with um, manuscripts from uh, a variety of uh, Middle Eastern minority communities, um, including uh, this, this collection from Jerusalem, um, 
which uh, you know the vast majority of it is in, is in Arabic, but uh, there's a couple things in Kurdish like this. Um, and uh, you know, I just want to talk about um, our work, our history, and um, and uh, you know what we've been doing in terms of originally microfilming and then digitizing uh, manuscripts from around the world. Um, and I would love when we get to the Q and A um, to hear just um, you know questions and feedback from from all of you about um, uh, about uh, the the work that we do and and the uh, procedures that we have in place for our digitization and our cataloging and um, you know just uh, thoughts about um, uh, the, this work and and how it contributes uh, to um, preserving the heritage of uh, Middle Eastern minority communities. Um, so I, I want to dive right in um, and uh, yeah give you a sense of kind of the, the setting of where we are um, and uh, you know put things in context. Um, so we are located in Collegeville, Minnesota, which um, has a name like a town, but it's not really much of a town. It's just a, a college campus out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, it's a, a beautiful setting out uh, you know, in the, the woods of Minnesota by several lakes. Um, it's a Benedictine Abbey and university uh, has, uh, a couple thousand uh, students. Um, and this, so the, to give you the sort of um, origin story here, uh, this land, um, uh, everything you see in orange on this uh, map of southern Minnesota uh, was um, acquired by the United States government in 1851 um, from the Dakota people as the result of a, uh, a treaty that was signed um, under uh, the rest and in a uh, uh, condition of uh, extreme debt to fur traders. Um, and so uh, their territory was reduced in Minnesota to almost nothing uh, just along the Minnesota River. And uh, the, the spot that would eventually become St. John's University is this red star here, um, which you can see is kind of right on the edge of this territory. Um, so it's the United States considered it to be property of the Dakotas. Um, there were a lot of Ojibwe's living in the area as well. Um, but uh, in any case, it was uh, purchased through this treaty and then opened up for settlement by Europeans uh, very quickly thereafter. So um, a large number of uh, people started to come to the area, especially um, German Catholics. And so in 1856, a group of monks uh, from the Pittsburgh area relocated to the St. Cloud area and opened their abbey here um, where they worked with these new settlers. Um, and then uh, in, the, uh, in the following year, the, the, um, what would become St. John's University was founded as a sort of um, seminary for the Benedictines. Um, and then, uh, so the university is still, uh, still in operation today, but in the 1960s, a project was started here, um, which uh, eventually became Himmel. Um, and basically it was started by people at St. John's who were concerned about um, the prospect of some sort of World War III or um, you know, nuclear conflict uh, during the Cold War uh, that would wipe out a lot of the cultural heritage of um, other Benedictine communities, especially, uh, although you know, broader than that, but originally, Benedictine communities in Western Europe. Um, there had been, you know, as you know, as is obvious, there had been massive uh, destruction of culture in um, uh, both of the previous world wars. Um, and they were thinking of ways that they could uh, you know, mitigate uh, the possibility of that happening again. And they had heard about uh, a project um, out of St. Louis University that was making microfilm copies of uh, items from the Vatican Library. Um, and they thought that this could be a, a good way to uh, create copies of these Benedictine collections in Europe, uh, bring them to Minnesota, where um, there would be a kind of backup in case of any um, damage or destruction that occurred. And they, um, they got some initial funding from the Hill Family Foundation, which is uh, ultimately the wealth of um, 
James J. Hill, uh, the um, one of the richest people in history, uh, um, railroad uh, magnate from St. Paul from the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, uh, but the, his descendants, uh, at least some of them, were um, interested in this project and they funded it. And so their name is still in the name of the project now. Um, and it, there was um, some initial efforts in uh, with the Benedictine, um, the kind of uh, you know mother monastery of, of the Benedictine order in in Italy, um, uh, where uh, there was uh, an effort to to do photography there, and um, there was some confusion. They got they got permission from the abbot, but not from the librarian. And the librarian said, "I don't really care what the abbot says, so you can go away." And so they kind of wandered around Europe looking for another place where they might do this uh, photography and microfilming. And eventually they ended up at Kremsminster Abbey in Austria, which you can see a picture and a map um, here. It's a beautiful library. Um, and that was the first project. Uh, they uh, photographed their manuscripts, put them on microfilms. Um, uh, eventually uh, they ended up kind of traveling around Europe in this um, microfilm van uh, with the help of um, University Microfilms Company from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, so uh, you, the, um, the man on the left here, I believe, is Oliver Kapsner, who was the first director of the program, and the, the man on the right is from the microfilm company. Um, and uh, so this, this project continued to um, grow initially in Western Europe, uh, especially in Austria. Um, there was a lot of uh, early photography across Austria, not only in uh, these monasteries, but also in um, the Austrian National Library, which was um, a massive collection, as you might expect. Um, and so all of that was, was put on microfilm. Um, but in the early 1970s, uh, there was uh, an initial effort to move beyond Western Europe. Um, there was a uh, Vanderbilt professor, Walter, Walter Harrelson, um, who uh, was a professor of Old Testament, but was interested in um, Ethiopian manuscripts as a, um, as a uh, testament to some of the um, additional texts that are less known in Western Christianity, um, you know, apocryphal or pseudepigraphal texts. Um, and he met with uh, Abuna Theophilos, who is on the right in the, the photo here, um, who was the patriarch of the Ethiopian church at that time. And um, they, they had the idea to uh, do a similar microfilm project um, in Ethiopia. And uh, Abuna Theophilos was very um, excited about this, uh, this kind of opportunity. And so uh, they made contact with, um, with Himmel, and uh, Himmel began. Uh, a major project in Ethiopia in 1973, which was the first uh, the first move outside of Western Europe. Um, this was uh, this uh, project began just as Ethiopia was um, about to descend into a major civil war uh, with the death of Haile Selassie, um, and so uh, there was uh, there was a lot of chaos in the country as you would expect, um, but the uh, um, the manuscript photography continued for um, a decade or two, and um, a lot of these uh, microfilms that are at Himmel are um, you know, the only uh, remaining testimony to manuscripts that were destroyed or lost uh, during this uh, conflict. And uh, so the EMML, the Ethiopian part of the microfilm library, is um, uh, still a really uh, centrally important resource for um, uh, understanding the Ethiopian manuscript tradition, um, specifically Ethiopian Christian uh, you know, texts and Gez and Amharic and these sorts of things, Ethiopic texts. Um, and a, a scholar from Ethiopia named Gitachu Haile um, fled uh, this conflict when his life was in danger and he ended up working at Himmel for decades and just died in 2021. Um, but his work uh, cataloging the manuscripts, the, the microfilms, uh, and otherwise just um, publishing information about them has been um, one of the most important contributions to Ethiopian studies in, in 
the recent decades. Um, so at the same time, photography was continuing across Western Europe, all sorts of uh, countries, Germany, Spain, Portugal, et cetera. Um, a little bit in South Africa, but mostly in Western Europe, and then also in uh, Malta, um, where we continue to do a lot of a lot of work in Malta um, to this day. And the the library that is now the space where Himmel uh, is located was built in the mid seventies. You can see it being built here um, in the photo on the right. Um, so in two thousand three, there were several big changes. First of all, Columbus Stewart became the the executive director of Himmel. Um, and he's been in that position for 20 years now. Um, at the same time, uh, Himmel transitioned from using microfilm to using digital photography and uh, started to work in the Middle East for the first time. Um, so the first project in the Middle East was in uh, Lebanon at the um, Balamand Monastery, the Greek Orthodox Monastery of Balamand, which is uh, here on the right. Um, but uh, the, the work has progressed from there to Christian collections, especially across many, many countries of the Middle East. Um, and uh, so all of that kind of happened at the same time. Um, the, the change from microfilm to digital meant that the photos were much higher quality, they were in color uh, instead of black and white. And um, eventually it meant that uh, with the kind of uh, growing power of the internet, um, these images could actually be put online for viewing. Um, so that that happened in um, uh, the 2010s, uh, 2015, um, that we actually launched the online reading room where, where all of these digitized manuscripts are visible. Um, so most of the microfilms are still, you know, here in Minnesota in our basement, uh, and um, they are, uh, some of them are scanned, some of them are not, uh, but they're all available for use, but it's, you have to either come here to Collegeville or you have to uh, you know, pay a fee for them to be scanned, uh, where the digital is all visible online for free with an account. Um, so uh, in 2012, we did our first work with collections that were not owned by Christian communities. So it, we had been working across the Middle East in churches, monasteries, private collections. Um, we were doing work in uh, Jerusalem at uh, some monasteries there, and um, some of the prominent uh, Palestinian Muslim families in the old city um, got in contact with us, and um, there was a suggestion that we digitize their manuscripts as well. Um, and so that was our, uh, our first um, step into uh, this more kind of diverse global uh, project. And it's um, it's uh, it's only yeah, 11 years ago now, but uh, but it's become a huge part of what we do. And especially because in, in the following year, 2013, we started work in Mali um, with the manuscripts from Timbuktu uh, that had been um, smuggled out of the city uh, during the conflict there. Um, and um, the Mali collections are now, um, I mean, essentially once they're all, all online, they will completely dwarf everything else that Himmel has ever ever done um, in number. It's hundreds of thousands of manuscripts um, from Mali. Uh, so that's that's now just a massive part of, of what we do. And we have two um, full-time catalogers working on just Molly um, manuscripts, and um, they, I think our um, librarian calculated recently that um, the, it would take uh, about 124 years for, for them to work, for just to catalog it all, um, because it's so much. So, uh, you know, we're working as, as much as we can, but it's a massive amount of material. Um, maybe, maybe with two of them, it only takes 60 years, but that's still a, lot, a long time. Um, so, uh, so that, you know, um, these collections that are, um, uh, that are in Muslim, uh, ownership specifically is now a huge part of, of our collections, um, including West Africa above all, but also, uh, things like this that you see here on the right, uh, which is, um, uh, a manuscript from Yemen, it's in Slana, and it's, uh, a, um, 
part of the Zaidi Manuscript Tradition Project, which was run by Sabina Schmidtke out of the um, Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Uh, but the images are all hosted on our site and they are all cataloged. Um, the ones that are um, in Yemen are now cataloged now. Um, so, uh, you know, we have these other um, examples of, of Muslim manuscripts from the Middle East as well. Um, so, yeah, other recent events um, include uh, the launch of the Himmel Authority file, uh, which I was talking about with Denise the other day. Um, I want to show you just a little bit of, of what it is, um, because it's a real exciting project that we've been uh, working on for two or three years now. Um, we got a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities a few years ago, uh, which has allowed us to hire a large team of catalogers, but um, has also funded things like the development of this database. And um, it's, uh, it's essentially just a, a, a database of, of names and titles um, for, uh, and you know, other things as you see here, organizations, places. Um, for uh, anything that we've cataloged. Uh, and we, we began the work with um, the Eastern Christian and Islamic uh, names and titles, and they're now slowly working on adding the um, Western European names, uh, but it takes a long time. It's a lot of them. Um, but uh, we, uh, um, you know, part of the reason that this was funded was because it was a way to um, devote some real scholarly and uh, some real library attention, uh, cataloging attention to um, these uh, traditions that are less well known in Western scholarship, um, Eastern Christianity, uh, West African Islam, you know, some of these minority groups that, that we're talking about um, to, to really bring attention to, um, to their you know, authors and their titles and, and you know, determine uh, you know, try to get uh, as much information about each of them as we can. Um, so there's a variety of ways it's useful. Um, one way is it can help you find, you know, what's the standard form of someone's name that we're using. So like, uh, if you go through all the language traditions of the world and you, you know, think about all the ways that people spell Theodore or some other name like this, you know, um, there's a lot of Theodores, but then there's also like a, you know, uh, Theodoros and um, you know, there's various ways to spell it. If you're looking for Theodore Abukura and you want to know, you know, um, how is his name going to be spelled in our in our system? It's here, but we have all these variants here, so it allows you to find um, to find the person and identify what the standard form of their name is that we're using. Because um, as our system is set up right now, our reading room system, we can only have uh, one or potentially two. Um, kind of spellings or versions of someone's name. So this is a good way to get like alternate um, spellings and also native script spellings, you know, to get uh, the, you can search it in uh, not only English or Roman script, but you can search it in Arabic script, Syriac script, you know, whatever's appropriate to the person that you're looking for. Um, and then you can find, you know, what titles do we have that that person has written or been involved in. Um, it's all, you know, we try to have it all kind of linked together in there. Um, so uh, that's um, an example of something we've been working on in, in very recent years. Um, and, uh, you know, that's been a real, it's been a real help for our own cataloging to help keep things standardized, but it's also um, exciting just as a, an open access resource for anyone who, who wants more information on, um, you know, these names and titles that we're working with. And especially, it's especially for non-Western um, people. So um, yeah, we have, we have over a hundred thousand items in our reading room now, um, both digital manuscripts and uh, microfilms, uh, in just like records of microfilms to help you find out what we have on site. Um, and as you can see, we're currently working in a number of uh, places uh, around the world. Um, I believe that this picture here is from Ukraine. Uh, where we're working in Lviv, um, but uh, yeah, how does the how does the process work? Um, we provide the equipment and the training, and and we pay for people at the library where we're working. Um, we pay for them to do the photography, so we hire them. 
um, the photography in general is all done by people who are actually from the, you know, the communities that own and, and uh, care for these manuscripts. Um, we, uh, um, the manuscripts remain uh, on site. They don't have to uh, be transported to some uh, central location in most places, and they don't have to be taken to Europe or America as so many manuscripts have been um, taken in the past. Um, the library retains ownership rights and control over reproduction and publication. So uh, if anyone wants to um, publish uh, you know, an image of uh, one of these manuscripts, then they send us a form and we, send, we contact the people who own the library. And that can be modified. Sometimes they don't really care and they just give us permission to um, let people publish whatever. Um, but uh, in general, we allow, we allow them to have the say in, in how that happens. Um, they receive a hard drive copy of the images. We receive a copy. We put another copy in a cave in a mountain somewhere in Utah so that it doesn't get you know, blown up. Um, so you know, there's, there's efforts to, to ensure you know, uh, that there's multiple copies out there in addition, of course, to the physical copy which remains in the library. Um, all of the images are made available for viewing for free. Um, we catalog them. Uh, we, uh, um, you have to have an account to view them, which helps to prevent um, you know, um, people using them uh, or helps, helps us to understand who is using them and uh, if someone is um, actually trying to like download a bunch of them against the, um, against the policies, then you know, we can try to control that in certain ways. Um, and, uh, you know, some, sometimes the images are provided by partner projects uh, and not done directly by our, um, by us with our equipment. Um, and uh, the Zadie Manuscript Tradition project that I mentioned is an example of, of this. Um, so they, they gather all of these images of Zadie manuscripts from Yemen, but also from Europe and America, and they send them to us and we put them on our site. Um, yeah, we offer research fellowships uh, for people who want to come and do research here at, at Himmel for a few weeks or a month or um, anything. You know, visiting scholars are always welcome, but we also have these fellowships to help uh, for, you know, for travel and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I mentioned this primarily to say that one of them is specifically for Eastern Christian Manuscript Studies, the Swenson Family Fellowship. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's important to keep in mind when we're talking about um, minority communities in the Middle East, there is funding available specifically for studying um, Eastern Christian manuscripts. Um, we also offer language courses in partnership, in partnership with Dumbarton Oaks. Uh, so far, they have all been Syriac, Armenian, and Coptic. So it's all, again, Middle Eastern Christian languages. Um, and we also offer an introduction to Arabic manuscripts course, um, which features some of the things that our collections uh, excel in such as Eastern Christian and West African Arabic manuscripts. Um, so that's a kind of um, unique aspect of, of the course. Um, so um, just to give a brief overview of you know, what collections we actually have um, from Middle Eastern minority communities, um, we are still, still working. We have part of the collection of uh, the Macarius Monastery in uh, Egypt. Um, which uh, is, is ongoing. We have uh, one very small collection from Tehran, um, a Chaldean Catholic church. Uh, but then from places like Iraq, we have um, over 90 different collections. Some of them are small private collections, just a couple manuscripts that someone has in their house. Others are, you know, 900 manuscripts that the Dominican friars in Mosul have. Um, so, it's a variety, um, it's many thousands of manuscripts, um, and it's from a variety of, uh, of Syriac traditions and also Armenian churches. Um, a lot of this, uh, the vast majority of this has been through a partnership with the Centre Numérique des Manuscrits Orientaux, um, which is a project by uh, Father Najib Mikhail, who is now the Chaldean Catholic Archbishop of Mosul, um, but he has been a um, a partner of ours in digitization uh, for a uh, long time now. Um, and some of these, uh, you know, these collections um, 
you know, the one I have here on the right is from Marbetha Monastery. These are um, the Marbetha collection was uh, hidden in barrels and they built a, a wall uh, to hide the room where they were stored uh, when ISIS took over the uh, monastery. Um, and when they returned, um, ISIS had not discovered that room. Um, so the, uh, the manuscripts were intact. Um, others, like some of the Dominican friars' manuscripts, I believe, were tossed into the trunks of cars and smuggled out uh, of Mosul, uh, you know, with half an hour to spare, basically. Um, uh, so uh, there were uh, a number of, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that everything that we photographed in these collections is, uh, is not still there, but uh, um, a lot of it was was saved in various ways, um, but uh, you know that is kind of one of the, um, you know, just a, an example of the importance of, um, of of preserving these things because there's uh, uh, we try to prioritize places that are considered to be endangered by some sort of threat, conflict, uh, etc. Um, but yeah, you just never know. Um, we have uh, we have two. Uh, Christian collections from Jerusalem, um, Syriac Monastery, and a Greek Catholic seminary. Um, we uh, we have many collections from Lebanon, from a number of that country's uh, Christian communities. Um, I love this this one that I have two pictures of here. This was one of the first things that I cataloged, and it's just a really wonderful manuscript with all sorts of beautiful pictures, and also um, a picture of a monk being carried off by a um, a huge bird. Um, we have uh, a number of collections from Syria that were mostly photographed before the war started there. Um, the uh, we have not really gotten back in after the war, or you know, in the later years of the war, or whatever stage it is now. Um, but uh, um, we've uh, we were working closely with a lot of the communities there um, prior to uh, twenty eleven and twelve. Um, so, uh, for example, this, um, this manuscript here is one of the, um, treasures of, of our collections, which is, um, at the Syriac Orthodox Archdiocese of Aleppo. It's the only co copy in the world of the Chronicle of Michael the Great, uh, in Syriac, which is one of the, um, one of the really important medieval, uh, world histories. Um, in Turkey, we've worked with, uh, a number of different Syriac and Armenian collections. You can see an Armenian manuscript here. Um, and that's both uh, in the Istanbul area, especially with Armenian churches, and then also in the Turabdin Syriac region in the Southeast, um, where we have a, a number of Syriac Orthodox and Chaldean Catholic collections. Um, yeah, so then outside of Christianity, uh, we've worked with these Palestinian Muslim collections in Jerusalem and Gaza. We have uh, four collections from Jerusalem and one from Gaza um, that are now uh, fully cataloged and available. Um, we, uh, we have the collections I mentioned from Yemen, which is 14 different collections. Again, some of them are small private collections, some of them are larger, uh, but it's from Zaidi, Zaidi communities all across northern Yemen in the, the various highland cities where the Zaidis uh, live. So uh, we have a large number of uh, over 700 manuscripts from, from Yemen. Um, and then there are uh, some, you know, examples of uh, manuscripts from Middle Eastern minority communities that are in other libraries, such as European libraries, um, these, uh, you know, these collections will generally have, you know, if it's a big kind of like Austrian National Library, then they have a, a huge collection of like 3,000 or so um, Islamic manuscripts, but then there are some Christian manuscripts in there, some minority, some other minority community uh, manuscripts. So that, you know, there's a lot of resources there, um, but it, it's not the, the focus of their collection. Um, and uh, this includes Austrian National Library, University of Tumia, uh, Montserrat Abbey in Spain has a huge Eastern Christian collection, both Syriac and Arabic. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of resources there. 
But as I mentioned earlier, the, these are generally on microfilm. You know, most of our work in Western Europe has been on microfilm, and so it's a little less accessible. Um, some of them have been digitized by the libraries that own them, such as this uh, manuscript here, which is in Tübingen, um, and you can see it on their site. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And then uh, also we have a small collection here on site in Minnesota, um, which includes uh, works by um, Middle Eastern Christians, especially as a, um, as a minority from the Middle East. Um, and uh, one, one real gem of our collection, probably I mean, one of the, the real uh, most interesting things that we have is this um, Georgian manuscript from the 10th century. Uh, when we acquired it, it was labeled as an Armenian manuscript from the 17th century. Um, and someone eventually figured out that it was Georgian, not Armenian, um, but also that it has, and, and, and that it's uh, about 700 years earlier than that, and also that it has not one, but two Syriac undertexts. Uh, it's a palimpsest, um, and uh, those are uh, really valuable testaments, too. Uh, one is from the Gospel of Matthew, and one is a, uh, an otherwise unknown Syriac uh, passage from the history of the monks of Syria, um, and those are both, uh, you know, one is maybe 5th, 6th century, and one is like 7th or 8th, so yeah, really, uh, really cool, uh, just two leaves, but um, really uh, uh, a gem of our collections here, so um, all this overview to say, you know, there are some, some minority communities in the Middle East that have been a real focus of our work over the last decades, um, since 2003, essentially, and uh, primarily that's Christian communities in the Middle East, and, and um, Himmel has, has been long established as a um, key resource for um, anyone who's interested in, in Syriac or Christian Arabic. Um, that uh, those, those have been, you know, we have photographed entire collections that are owned by these communities. We have really, like, um, we preserve a huge part of um, the manuscript heritage of these groups, um, and and you know to a lesser extent, this is also now true in more recent years of Palestinian Muslims, uh, Zaidi Muslims in Yemen, etc. Um, but then there are um, other communities, other minority communities in the Middle East whose manuscripts appear in our collections, kind of um, incidentally. They they happen to be you know there's a few here or there scattered into the larger. Um, the larger collections, and and there's a you know a list here. We've got a number of Druze manuscripts, for example, this one here, uh, which is held in the Christian collection in, in Lebanon. Um, the University of Tübingen has about 40 manuscripts by Ismaili Muslims um, that we have on microfilm. Um, we have a few Jewish manuscripts, both on site and digitized and microfilmed. Not a lot, but a few. Um, a few things by you know these various other groups, Yazidis or Austrians. Baha'is in the um, uh, Austrian National Library. As of last week, I added Alawites to this list because I found an Alawite manuscript in the um, Université Saint Joseph collection from Beirut. Um, so uh, you know, there's all these different um, uh, smaller minority groups that um, are, you know, represented by just a few manuscripts in our collections, but they're they're present. Um, and then there are groups like the Kurds who are not necessarily a religious minority, but a linguistic minority. Um, and uh, I already showed you uh, one example. We have a number of examples of texts in Kurdish and about Kurds, um, both by Kurdish Muslims and by um, Christians uh, written in Kurdish, uh, sometimes Kurdish Harshuni, so Kurdish and Syriac script. Um, so to, to, to wrap up here, um, I have these, these questions, um, which I think are to some extent open questions for the discussion for us uh, during the Q and A, um, I you know questions about our work and and um, you know what how it how it plays into the the lives of um, minority communities in the Middle East, how it uh, furthers the the work of uh, social justice there and elsewhere. Um, so, I mean, one thing is uh, when we do these digitization projects, you know, how do we make sure that the, um, the, the actual objects are not neglected? Um, because uh, it's possible to, um, 
you know, to say, well, we have a digital copy now, so it doesn't actually matter what happens to the um, to the physical object. And that's, you know, um, that's something that we don't want our digitization work to lead to, uh, but it's a it's a danger in, in this sort of work that uh, needs to be kept in mind. Um, uh, another thing is, um, you know, how do we keep these digital objects actually working? Because um, anything that you know was was made 20 years ago um, that's a you know, computer file is on is are hardly ever actually usable now because the technology changes all the time and uh, you know you can't hardly find a place to access information on a floppy disk or even a CD you know in some cases um, and so uh, you know we have to have a um, we have to have tech people who make sure that we're you know staying maybe not exactly on the cutting edge but on the you know the edge of things that are going to be widely adopted and used for a long period of time um, and to keep kind of updating um, the, uh, the the files and the, and the storage systems that we have in place and that um, I mean that means um, a lot of just funding and and uh, maintenance for forever uh, because uh, um, it, it works in a way that the you know with these physical objects uh, they they're put on parchment or they're or they're put on paper and then um, you know they can be uh, they can be damaged, they can they can deteriorate over time, um, but they still just kind of exist uh, and and can be accessed. So um, digital, you know, this is all we say we're making copies to to make sure that they stay around forever. But uh, what's the chance that, that these digital files actually outlast the, the books that they're um, that they're copying? Um, we then, you know, with unauthorized use of the images, you know, we, we try as I mentioned before, we try to maintain that, uh, you know, all the rights and permissions for the library that owns them. Um, it can be hard to kind of uh, keep it, keep track, you know, anyone can do a screenshot. And so it can be hard to, uh, to keep track of um, uh, images being uh, kind of taken and used uh, without the library's permissions. Um, but we, that's part of our work is to make sure that, that we're doing as much as we can on that. Um, and then, you know, uh, this is a question that was raised in the description of the lecture series, you know, whose heritage is being preserved and who chooses. Uh, this is, um, uh, I mean, these things kind of work through, um, you know, networks and word of mouth. I mean, you know, I mentioned that our first connection to um, collections owned by non-Christians was uh, in Jerusalem because there happened to be uh, a a number of Palestinian families who had libraries right down the street from where the uh, St. Mark's Monastery is. So, you know, the um, things kind of work through networks, but how do you, um, how do you make sure that you're, uh, you know, accessing, uh, that you're making yourself available to um, as many communities as you can. Um, and then cataloging, you know, how do we catalog in a way that, um, that can be Understood and used by people from different languages and cultures, um, you know things like the the variant names in half uh, the Himmel Authority file that I showed earlier, or the um, you know we we try to use uh, uh, a lot of alternate titles uh, when we're cataloging. So we have we always try to have the title in native script, so Arabic script or Syriac script or, or whatever it is, in transliteration and in um, often in English, you know, some sort of device title in English. So um, we try to make it kind of usable for in, in various ways. Um, and then who actually benefits? I mean, of course, we, you know, this is not some kind of just disinterested thing. It's, it raises our profile and, um, and grows, uh, grows awareness of Himmel's work around the world. Um, but, you know, I like to think that it also helps, uh, you know, raise awareness about these communities. Um, and also, I think one thing that's really important with this work is that it um, it makes these manuscripts available for diaspora um, communities because, you know, Middle Eastern Christians, for, for example, now live um, all across the world. And there, you know, there's not actually that many in a lot of the home countries where they came from. Um, but, you know, they can access some of their own cultural heritage through um, uh, 
uh, this uh, you know, kind of digital access uh, wherever they are. Um, so there's there's a number of questions here that I would love to talk about in the Q and A. Um, I just want to close by pointing out this um, manuscript here um, as a kind of example of uh, why we do what we do. This is a manuscript that we um, did not get to in time uh, to photograph it. Um, this we we photograph in in Iraq, as I said, we photographed a lot of manuscripts that were eventually um, endangered by uh, by ISIS. But this is one that we um, that we couldn't save from uh, our own government because the um, this this was damaged in the U.S. invasion in 2003. As far as I am aware, uh, the manuscripts were hidden underground, um, and the space where they were was flooded. And so, um, you know, this is a manuscript that existed for um, about 1,200 years um, and was in good condition uh, until. 2003, uh, and now it looks like this. Um, so, uh, you know, this is part of uh, why we do what we do to to try and avoid um, images like this. Uh, but um, I'm I'm happy now. It's uh, I'm a little I've gone a little longer than I uh, should have, but uh, I'm happy to um, open the floor up for questions and comments and and to hear from from all of you. Thanks so much for for the invitation and for um, your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Mugler. Um, I will go to the questions in the chat. Um, our first is from Dr. Faras Beatty, um, who writes, uh, very interesting, thank you. I have a question about this collection. Are they available online for public users, meaning the digital ones? And um, they also say that if you have a similar project in Lebanon uh, to not hesitate to contact them for any help or collaboration and um, their email is in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so the, um, I'll put the link, uh, I'll put the link in the chat just to our online reading room. This is where we have all of the, all of our digital manuscripts are um, available for viewing. Um, where's the chat, where's the chat? Um, in our reading room. So uh, yeah, you have to create an account to view most of them, but the account is free and the viewing is free and it's all um, available there. So yeah, once we have uh, once we have the images and um, you know once we get it all cataloged and everything, then we put it in there. And thanks for your contact information. I'll be sure to. Uh, Get in touch. Well, while we're waiting for some more questions to come in, um, I have a, a question about the digitization process. Um, mm -hmm. You you mentioned about you know some difficulties with wars and civil unrest, and and how does that and how does that affect the people on the ground who are trying to digitize and what what sort of you know problems have have come up and that sort of thing yeah um yeah i mean of course it can be um devastating in so many ways uh we are currently doing projects uh in yemen um which is uh in a war zone at this point. Um, and uh, it's been a lot of uh, difficulties. You know, there's there's a lot of difficulties um, with just the, the ability to get um, things like hard drives and cameras in and out of the country uh, and um, to be in contact with people. And, you know, I can't go into too many of the details, but, um, but it can be, it can, uh, you know, of course, cause all sorts of um, devastating effects on people's lives, uh, but it can also be very hard for these people who are trying to trying to do this work to preserve their own heritage um, and just you know to be be able to um, to be able to do the work and to be able to get the results of the work um, out to 
to us and to the wider world can be extremely difficult at times. Um, so yeah, it can be a real challenge. I expect that there has to be, you know, um, workarounds and creative yeah. solutions to getting equipment in and out and mm -hmm. getting the images and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, it's, uh, you know, it's so, so many high quality images that it can't just be sent online, you know, over the internet, um, which, of course, the internet can also be um, uh, difficult to access in some situations. But yeah, unfortunately, it does require actual physical elements like hard drives and things like that. Um, which can be a real challenge. Yeah, um, Amanda has a question. Um, she writes, thank you so much for this interesting history. My question is whether you have ever decided not to put something online because of community and or local concerns. Uh, yeah, well, we have, um, we have policies about things like privacy. Um, you know, if there are, sometimes there will be, um, kind of archival material uh, from recent times that uh, is in these collections and it'll be photographed and it's like, you know, a record of births and deaths in this parish for, you know, the last 50 years or something like that. And that's, you know, we have uh, concerns about um, privacy of the people who are, you know, maybe still alive or their near family members are still alive. And so, um, with those things, we have policies about um, uh, not putting the images online, uh, you know, not uh, putting the records online, um, just for those kinds of individual things. Um, the the communities that um, that photograph the the manuscript collect that their own manuscript collections, um, we try to make sure that they have uh, a decent amount of um, of uh, control over what they're actually photographing. Um, they, we encourage them to photograph as extensively as possible to, you know, we don't want them to just like pick and choose random manuscripts in the collection, but, um, uh, but ultimately it, in some, to some extent it's up to them. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, if they have um, portions of their collection that, they don't um, feel comfortable uh, making available, then uh, that could be um, you know, something that's uh, that's a little bit uh, under their control. So, um, so yes, there are you know, things that that could have gone online that that don't. Generally, once they photograph them and send them to us, the expectation is we're going to put these all online for people to see, and, unless there are like privacy issues. Um, but uh, um, but yeah, that is, uh, I think that's a really, it's an interesting question. You know, we're trying to like expand access to these things, um, but uh, not every community actually wants wider access to their, um, their heritage for a variety of reasons. And so, um, you know, some, some groups may just not want to, do this kind of project because they don't actually want their manuscripts to be available online, which that's that's their choice. Um, so uh, so yeah, but there are definitely different perspectives among the different people uh, about whether this is the kind of thing that they actually want to happen to their um, to their collections. So our next question is from Lindsay O'Brien. Um, how many staff members do you generally have working on this project at any given time? We have, um, well, we have, we have a number of different kind of branches of the staff. Um, I think the, the staff, the actual Himmel staff is usually probably about, well, over the last few years has, has been maybe about 25-ish. Um, and that's that's uh, in large part because this NEH grant has allowed us to hire a big team of catalogers to work on things like Eastern Christian manuscripts um, and Islamic manuscripts. Um, the that that does not include um, 
like the people who are doing the photography that are people from those libraries that we hire. Um, but we have um, field directors who are kind of in touch with those libraries. We have office staff here in Minnesota. We have curators and catalogers, and we have our metadata librarian, Catherine Walsh, who is um, responsible for things like HAP, uh, the Himmel Authority file, and other kind of cataloging um, issues. So um, yeah, I mean, the shortest answer would be probably about 25. Um, from Asuman, uh, thank you, Josh, for this great presentation. Is there any transliteration or translation service for researchers who cannot read vernacular language? Uh, not that we provide. Um, that's uh, a little bit outside of our purview. Um, I imagine that there would be um, people who, you know, services that could that could do those things um but uh, that's not something that we generally offer um if uh and that that's um that's kind of a a broader point about what kind of collections we have um which is that um they're just images they're not we we haven't tried to run them all through ocr or something to to try and uh make them all text searchable um so you know What's searchable is the things that we put in the cataloging titles, authors, um, yeah, you know, opening lines and kibbits, um, that sort of thing. And, and uh, you know, a lot of that is in native script. A lot of it is transliterated and translated, um, but we don't have any sort of like full text transliteration or, or even transcription um, uh, of, the, of the manuscript. So that would have to be something that, that people would do um, on their own. Um, and, and partially that's because the, the sort of OCR technology and that sort of thing is not really there yet. Although there's a, there are various projects working on it. There's a big project at the University of Maryland um, that has worked with us some on developing technology that can read uh, Arabic manuscript writing. Um, but that technology is not really there yet. And uh, it would also create just, um, even more of a massive uh, amount of data than we already have with just the images. Uh, so there would there would probably be some uh, data storage issues at that point. Um, but uh, but yeah, so the we we don't we don't offer that sort of service ourselves. Uh, but thanks for the question. Um, I'd like to conclude with one final question. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so you you mentioned that um, that often when you're selecting collections for digitization that it, it happens through like just connections. Um, I was curious about other avenues um, as well as what sort of criteria are applied for determining whether a collection should be digitized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um... We do have, um, depending on the situation. So for example, right now we have um, a field worker in Pakistan and a field worker in India who are um, making contacts with various um, libraries uh, to um, help expand um, what we have available there. Um, the, uh, and that's just because we're um, we're kind of growing in that in that region, and we've got a few libraries, but uh, we'll be happy to have more. Um, the uh, yeah, the um, the criteria that go into you know determining is uh, as I said, if if we can try to prioritize um, collections that we think are you know in more danger of being damaged or destroyed, um, then that's a real plus. Uh, I wouldn't say that every single collection we've ever done falls into those categories, but um, you know, things that things that are in, you know, conflict areas and that sort of thing that that we really feel like there's um, there's a very strong case to be made that these these need to be uh, preserved because there could be 
um, they could be in danger uh, soon. Um, you know, other than that, we prioritize things that kind of fit with uh, what we already have uh, photographed to some extent. You know, we, we're starting to expand now into like South Asian Buddhist collections and things like that, but we don't actually have anyone on staff yet who can read and catalog those. So at some point, you know, the, the cataloging will lag behind the photography, um, but at some point we'll need to, to hire people who know what they're doing with those. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's good to, to photograph things that you already have some experience with because you have the right, the right people to, to do the work. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of, you know, how we, how we try to, to, to choose, um, the collections that we're working with. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, ultimately, um, it all has to, someone has to hear about the project somehow, you know, we have to, uh, we have to make contact with, with, uh, with them. And so, um, you know, we, uh, we, you know, we have to work through various, through various networks to just like get in, get in touch. And, and there's, you know, there's so much out there that we could try to work on, you know, just all, all over the world, you know, there's no end of, of, of these, uh, these written treasures that people have. Um, but uh, we're always trying to kind of work from where we are to something that might be a, a good project to do next. Um, so, yeah. Great. All right, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your fascinating talk and discussion. It was really educational to hear all about Himmel and, and the work that you do and its history. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, we will be sending out information about our February lecture in the next two or three weeks. And as a reminder, please do donate to our GoFundMe campaign if you would like the series to continue. Uh, again, thank you very much to everyone and we hope to see you again next month. Thanks everybody, thanks for coming. <laughs>